Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Profiles in Risk. I am your host, Nick Lamparelli. I am very pleased to introduce Gabriel Glenn. Gabriel is the co-founder and CEO of Make You Safe. Make You Safe is developing wearable technology paired with a powerful data analytics system for a labor worker for labor worker industries like manufacturing, agricultural, logistics, and more. Their products focus on worker safety and productivity through the real-time measurement of workplace conditions and hazards. Gabriel is also the founder and host of Advanced Manufacturing Podcast. Ironic that we're here. We're going to talk about that, right. uh, which is the source for everything new and exciting in manufacturing. Gabriel, good morning. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. No, I, I love it. We were, we were chatting before uh, we hit the record button. Uh, the name of the company is Make You Safe, M-A-K-U-S-A-F-E. And you said that that is actually a play on words. Describe. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I wish I could take credit, but it's certainly somebody smarter than me that helped come up with this. But please, Maku. <laughs> please tell me it wasn't a marketing consultant. <laughs> no, no. It was actually uh, one of the guys that helped kind of kick things off for our company. Um, good, good. So uh, Maku, M-A-K-U is Hawaiian for risk. And our whole goal is to reduce risk. Uh, inside facilities to reduce risk and so we kind of put a play on the words put a line over the a we pronounced it uh, pronounce it make you safe um, but the actual corporation is Mako safe corporation yeah. oh, it's beautiful uh, I, I love that I love uh, play on words we tried to do the same thing with uh, with my MGA um, you you briefly touched on it why don't you give an elevator pitch um, for make you safe what is make you safe in your in your own words yeah I guess uh, in the, in the industry buzzwords, right, it's, a, it's an enterprise risk management system. Uh, in our words, it was a way to uh, monitor in real time and directly on the person the environmental conditions and the worker motion uh, factors that influence risk and help us understand where risk inside of a facility helps um, or starts to represent itself. And then we use tools to identify that. And the whole goal is you know, if you kind of think about it like a forecast, like a weather forecast, right? With the right amount of data, we can start to predict when and where weather is going to change, where risk in the weather is going to represent itself. And uh, we believe that we can do the same thing using the right amount of data um, in a facility setting, be able to monitor all of the conditions that are happening, understand at what confluence of those conditions does risk represent itself, and then start to be more proactive in the way that we uh, approach risk mitigation. How does that work? So um, is it a bunch of people just wearing Fitbits? I, I'm, I, I know it's a little bit more elaborate than that. Can you go into what it takes to monitor workers in these kinds of environments? Yeah, I think maybe if I step back and kind of give the context of really how it came about, sure. I think that's actually going to, um, going to help kind of paint a picture of why we're tracking the things that we're tracking. Uh, we may actually touch on a couple of things uh, as I kind of give this little backstory, and I'm more than happy to jump back and talk about different things. But it really started um, with the sale of my software company about uh, three and a half years ago, about 2015. Uh, I had a software company here in Iowa, a uh, small shop. We had about 15 employees. We did a lot of um, manufacturing software stuff for the manufacturing industry. So I spent a lot of time around manufacturing. I mean, even going back to my childhood, uh, my father was a machinist for over 20 years. For the last 15 years, he's been a safety manager at a plant here in Iowa. So I really just kind of grew up around this stuff and always had a love for manufacturing, but a love for technology. So I was able to kind of mash that together with the software company I had. And we did a lot of things for the industry. Um, sold that company in 2015 to a larger software company. Spent a year kind of going through that transition period, moving our clients over, our team members over, uh, things like that. And then decided, you know what, I want to jump back into the startup world. But I didn't really know exactly what I was going to do, Nick. So um, I decided at the time I wanted to learn a new skill. I wanted to learn broadcast. I have the perfect face for radio. So I decided to... Uh, As do I. <laughs> so you're very brave doing the, the video stuff. I, I can't do this stuff. I got to do it all you know, behind the scenes on audio. Um, but I went to my church uh, here in Ankeny and I bought some old audio equipment. They were upgrading their sound boards, their, uh, their gates, some of their microphones, that kind of stuff. And I set up a podcast studio in downtown Des Moines. And I started interviewing the people that I had spent the last five, six years really getting to know. And what's interesting, like I'm sure many other places in the country, right, there's a lot of companies here 
in Iowa that started back in the 1800s. And they're still in existence today, obviously not doing what they did back in the 1800s, uh, you know, making horseshoes. Today, they're making automated touchscreen <laughs> screen handling systems and things yep. like that. Yep. Um, but I wanted to tell those stories. I was just fascinated by what these, uh, what these companies had done, how they survived over four or five generations and all of the changes, the industrial revolution, all of these things that they, um, that they experienced and yet they're still in existence today. And I thought, you know, those stories need to be told. They need to be at least saved. And I figured, you know, nobody's going to listen to it, but what the hell I'll record it and put it out there anyways. And, um, you know, pretty soon after I started recording and releasing these things, uh, thousands of people started listening and I started getting calls from all over the world of people saying, you know, Hey, we're a big fan of your podcast on iTunes. We're in Europe. We've got a really neat company. Do you want to talk to us? And I'm like, yeah, I do. that's awesome. Um, and it really just kind of evolved to uh, this opportunity to to recording and sharing uh, these stories. In fact, I even got a chance uh, about a year and a half ago uh, to go visit a handful of GE facilities. They took me on a on a flight around the country. We went to the robotics facility in Detroit, their jet engine facility in Lafayette, uh, their locomotive facility in Pennsylvania. Just a really cool tour and experience all because of this, this hobby podcast. So uh, keep doing what you're doing. You never know uh, where you might. Wait, you're, you're, I, I might get like another tour of Lloyd's. I'll, they'll, they'll yeah. fly me to London or Singapore. I love it. Absolutely. Sign me up. Let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it's, it's opened so many doors. It's been incredible. Uh, but it was really the podcast that inspired Make You Safe. So uh, I was out touring facilities one afternoon and I happened to go inside of a facility uh, to visit with their people. And I just happened to be there the day that they got a surprise audit from OSHA. Um, so they came in and they said, you know, one of your employees reported hearing loss. And, uh, and so we're going to do an audit today where your employees are going to wear these little wearable microphones uh, called dosimeters. Uh, they're going to spend the day wearing these things. At the end of the day, we're going to come back, collect all of these things, download the data, and we're going to find out if you guys are violating law and code and if you're going to be responsible and liable and, and everything for this employee's hearing loss, um, which the underlying tragedy of this whole thing is this person's experiencing hearing loss, right? And, and so they're trying to get to the bottom of it. And so I just started asking questions. I, you know, how how do you guys monitor environmental conditions? What things are governed by laws. Um, what kind of compliance and regulation do you have to deal with? And uh, what's your reporting process like? And really uh, what I started to get was this picture of, of how this particular company um, dealt with the environmental conditions and the things that, that we know impact a worker's you know, health, their safety, uh, their productivity, and their job satisfaction. And so armed with that experience, I went and I started calling all of these other companies that I had interviewed and talking to their safety people. And I heard the same story mm -hmm. over and over again. You know, hey, we, we pay a company thousands of dollars. They come in once a year. They test for this kind of stuff. We get a heat map. You know, it tells us where the bad spots are in the facility. They go away. Um, we assume it'll be the same the other 364 days. Yeah. Um, and then when an incident, you know, happens, um, then, we, then we get investigated or we do our own internal investigation. We try to get to the bottom of it, but it requires the incidents to happen for them to identify where the changes sure. happen. Sure. And so it was really that, um, that experience that inspired me to, to want to create something. Well, really we wanted to solve two problems. One, I said, we need to be constantly monitoring these conditions. Um, it needs to be something that's happening in real time. We need to understand when the conditions are starting to become unfavorable. Uh, for the employee, when risk is starting to represent itself, when they're getting close to a violating level. Um, and I wanted to do it from directly on the person because I knew from my experience that, you know, being in these factories, the environment can change in a matter of a few feet, depending on what side of a machine you're standing on or what areas of the facility you take paths through um, to do your work. All of those things can change, you know, the environment and the environment's constantly in flux, right? So having a wall mounted sensor a hundred yards away for understanding when your team needs to be on heat protocol and it says it's, you know, 89 degrees and just fine, but where the, these five workers are, it's 110 degrees because they're right around these machines that are producing a lot of heat. That represents risk to these people, right? It represents risk to the company, the likelihood of fatigue from that heat and the resulting accident that could happen from that fatigue is high. Right. That's why they have heat protocol. So you're not going to get that from a wall mounted sensor. You need to do that from on the individual. 
And so that was when I reached out to my co-founder, uh, Mark Frederick. And he was, at that time, he was at IBM in their uh, Internet of Things and Cloud Computing Department. And I presented uh, the challenge to him. And I said, you know, here's, here's what I want to do. But more importantly, here's why I wanted to do it. Um, through research, during that time where I was kind of exploring this technology, I did some research and I found out that more than 1,000 people a day die in work accidents on this planet. We had 56 here in Iowa last year, right? So it's a very real problem right here close to home. But just the thought of that many people not going home to their family at the end of the day, and I understand we're never going to eliminate risk. You know, we're never going to be able to send everybody home. You know, we're doing a variety of things. Automation is helping with that. You know, safety uh, procedures are helping with that. There's a lot of things we're doing, but I felt like if we could start forecasting and predicting risk, and being proactive in the way that we uh, approach that risk, we have the opportunity to significantly improve that number. And so that was our mission. That's what yeah. really inspired us to, to create the product. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a perfect discussion because I think for those that are listening that have the entrepreneurial bug, let, let's go into something like that. You, you clearly stated, the pro you saw the problem, you confirmed the problem, you had an idea of what the potential solution is, but you can't boil the ocean, right? You can't, so you, like you said, you're not, you're not going to be able to eliminate risk for everybody. So uh, what, what was the low-hanging fruit for you in terms of um, getting, getting the, the biggest impact for the, you know, the small amount of resources you were probably applying to the problem? Which, which industries or which type of workers were you looking at saying, if we start here, that's probably where we can have the biggest impact. This is probably where we can, you know, um, get basically get customers, get, get someone to buy into this because this is a, a really big problem. W what did you target first? Yeah, so there's actually, I think, two parts to that. I think one is, like, why do we pick the technology that we picked, right? Um, and then two is, like, well, why the industries that we picked? Well, the industries, I think, was the easy part because I had such a passion for manufacturing, there's over 6,000 manufacturing companies right here in my state of Iowa. Um, it's a huge industry. I have a great relationship and reputation in that industry, not only with the podcast, but being a part of the Iowa Association of Business and Industry, which was formerly the Iowa Manufacturers Association. Um, I run a summer camp for kids on manufacturing at a manufacturing plant here in central Iowa. Um, so just had a lot of ties to that industry. And it's a high risk industry. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, for accidents and, and incidents to happen. So that, that was an easy one. Another one is logistics facilities. Um, you know, being at the confluence of two of the largest interstates uh, in North America, right? Interstate 35 and Interstate 80 intersect right here in central Iowa. Um, so we have a lot of logistics, trucking facilities, shipping, receiving facilities. Um, and then the third is uh, commercial agriculture. So, um, you know, hog confinements and indoor commercial ag facilities. And the reason why we, we also pick those three is uh, they have similar environments. Um, you have workers that are inside of a fixed workplace, right? They're inside of walls of a building. Um, the environmental conditions are going to be a little bit more stable, a little bit more um, predictable based on patterns. Um, and the technology that we wanted to use was really going to target the things that those indoor workers are going to be exposed to um, and the things that are governed by OSHA uh, rules, regulations, things like lighting, right? Um, you have to have a certain amount of lighting inside of a facility for it to be considered safe and operational. You have to have um, sound controls in place, right? So we wanted to, you know, sound was what inspired it. We wanted to act as a full dosimeter. We want to track the time-weighted average. We want to know when somebody's being close to that violating level. Uh, air quality is another thing, um, right? Air quality can change dramatically throughout a shift, throughout a factory, um, you know, machines, oil mist, exhaust, um, trucks, uh, fork trucks, all of those kinds of things impact air quality. Um, and temperature, right? T temperature is a big one. Uh, and I think often overlooked temperature and humidity specifically together, right? Um, um, those two factors can lead to a significant amount of worker fatigue. Uh, so here in Iowa, we get hot, humid, you know, summer months, and uh, that can lead to a, a lot of potential risk. So a variety of factors like that that we wanted to focus on. And Nick, we also wanted to focus on um, 
we wanted to focus on the factors that look outward from the worker, right? Having grown up around the blue collar industry and spent so much time with workers, you know, one of the biggest concerns that we had was, you know, are employees going to embrace this? Or are they going to be like, well, I'm not going to let you put a, a tracker on me. Um, and we said, well, let's not make it about tracking that worker. Let's not make it about, uh, are they going to the bathroom for too long or going to, on smoke breaks too often? Or are they working fast enough when everybody else is working faster than them? Are they being as fast as they can be? So let's, let's make it about what's, what's going on in the environment around these workers um, that, that can be impacting you know, their health, safety, productivity, uh, job satisfaction, happiness. What's going on in that environment? Let's track human motion. Let's understand when they're tripping over things or slipping because the floor's got condensation. Um, if somebody falls down, you know, if they don't actually get hurt, how often do they actually take time to report that? Um, and, and lastly, we said we want to automate and streamline near miss reporting because all of our research and all of our experience said that near miss reporting is the number one way to re to prevent accidents right the near misses are the almost accidents so something that happened that really could have been an accident but really wasn't an accident and there's a full uh, paper form that you're supposed to fill out on that um, where it happened what was going on who was involved do they do yeah. that do, and, and do, no. I, I would i bet a lot of near misses would they just be like well nothing happened I don't have time to fill out, a, fill out paperwork. You nailed it. That's the number one reason that employees gave us and gave OSHA and the research as to why they don't fill these things out and why 90% of them go unreported is, look, I'm not going to stop my work, spend yeah. 15 minutes filling out a paper form on an accident that didn't happen when I'm told I have to make 100 widgets by the end of my shift. Yeah. You know, it's just not going to happen. But, but of course, it's incredibly valuable data. Insanely valuable, right? And so we said, well, if our device can automatically detect these things, right? So somebody trips over something, but they don't report it because they never fell and got hurt, right? Um, 11 more people are going to trip over whatever that is that they tripped over. And maybe person number 12 is the one who actually falls and breaks their wrist. And now you've got a $35,000 loss claim on your hand. You've got somebody out of work for six months. Um, and you had all of these leading indicators to tell you this was going to happen. Right. And so we said we want to we want to automate that whole process. Uh, we also want to arm the employees with a tool where they can simply just push a button on the device, talk into it. It knows who they are, where they are, what they said happened in the environment, what was going on in the environment when it happened, what they said happened with the incident and automatically prefill that near miss report form okay, for them. So, so, so what, you're, what you're saying is um, an employee could be walking out on the manufacturing floor. Uh, you, you mentioned condensation. They could see condensation. Instead of filling out some form, they could, with, with a push of a button, speak audio, right? That could, I, I'm guessing, be transcribed into text that goes into those forms. And now, with the, within just a few seconds, you've captured that potential, that potential exposure. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, in the case of condensation, for example, uh, maybe maybe they don't notice it, right? But they go into the area and they slip a little bit on the floor. Uh, they don't, they're not going to take the time to report that, you know. But the device picked that up. It knows that it slipped. It knows that it's 68% humidity. It knows that it's 91 degrees. It knows that it's in the shipping and receiving area of the department. As we gather more data, we use machine learning to process the data and identify what we call high-impact trends. And those high impact trends are what represents the most amount of risk in that facility. And so when we flag that high impact trend, safety managers, guys like my father, or operations managers can see that in the system and they can take appropriate remediation action steps based on what was identified. And the, the holy grail of where we're going with this is our system can now tie into uh, facility management systems, right? Air handling systems, all of those kinds of things, lighting systems. Uh, a lot of those stuff are, are, are those things are web enabled now. So if our system identifies that at 62% humidity and 91 degrees in the shipping and receiving department, we see a 30% increase in slips, probably because of condensation. Well, if somebody walks into that area and registers 61% humidity, let's kick on the air handling system automatically. Let's have that thing turn on. Let's have it bring the humidity levels down. Let's never even let that risk manifest itself. And let's not put that ownership in the hands of a maintenance person to recognize when the floor is slippery and go try to dry it out, right? We can automate some of the risk out. 
so ultimately that's what we're trying to get with some of these things in the facility. Yeah. So uh, for, for particular manufacturing, uh, worker, how many sensors are they wearing? And, uh, is it a special uniform that they have to put on or is it, is it like just attached to their, their general attire? <laughs> yeah, so this is where I'm on video. I should have actually had one of my <laughs> wearable devices to show. But <laughs> I, I'm I'm picturing like uh, the Intel white suits in the se- in the semiconductor yeah. facilities, <laughs> or if you've seen uh, the Black Panther, right? Like one of those exo suit. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, it's actually way more simple than that. So we knew from our experience in facilities, you can't have you know, hand and wrist worn things. In fact, a lot of the places that I go to, you know, I go in to do a tour, they take this off, they take my ring, they put it in a baggie, they take my cell phone, they put it in a baggie and it goes in security. Can you explain uh, why? Uh, risk, right? So a couple of reasons. One, they don't want these things getting caught on a machine, right? They don't want their, you know, workers getting their hand cut off because their their Apple Watch get, gets caught on a press break, right? Um, so that's that's a big part of the hand and wrist worn stuff. Uh, phones. Phones are a distraction uh, for employees and visitors. Um, they also have proprietary technology and proprietary things inside the facility. They don't want people taking pictures. Uh, in fact, a lot of the industry tours that I go on, um, they they, uh, they take all of the cell phones away, or if they allow them, um, their press person has to actually re- review all the photos before I can put anything out or publish anything. Um, so those are the reasons we said, okay, we need a piece of technology. One, that has a lot of the communication technology that you would have in a smartphone. We can't rely on somebody's iPhone to be the reporting tool, right? Um, you know, one, they're not allowed. Two, uh, th- there's 700 freaking dollars, right? Are you going to buy an iPhone for every one of your employees and put it in their hands and say, hey, this is, you know, this is how your safety device is going to communicate with us, right? So we knew we had to take technology and build it into the device. The other thing we knew is we wanted it to be up around the head, right? When you, when you do a sound audit, for example, um, you know, the, the device needs to be within so many inches of the ear um, to qualify as v- uh, valid data for that audit. So we said we need it to be up around the person's head. And so uh, we tested with armbands. And so, you know, people today, they, they run with their iPhones, they run with iPods, things like that. So there was a lot of different bands and things on the marketplace. And so how the device works, and there's a really cool little video if you go to uh, makeyousafe.com, it's M A K U safe com. you can see a short video there's a gal that comes into work and we have a kiosk and the kiosk holds 20 uh what we call cores and these cores are the are the parts of the the product that hold the technology that have all the sensor technology there's about a dozen sensors in there environmental and motion sensors so she punches in for her shift it assigns a device to her flashes and, and tells her which core she needs to take she takes that core and she clips it into her armband. And then she goes on throughout her day. And throughout her day, that device is sending data to our cloud platform. Things um, passively, it's gathering and sampling things and sending that data. And then it's actively looking for risk, right? So a trip over something, uh, over something or a slip, it's gonna gather that data and send it. At the end of her shift, she goes to any of the kiosks in the facility, uh, unclips the core, plugs it back in, it automatically checks, you know, the device back in uh, and punches her out for the shift. So uh, that's kind of how the technology works. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, we, we haven't even talked about insurance. And to me, um, of, of course, uh, livelihood is most important. Um, we, we, you know, you, you mentioned the number of global deaths and the number of deaths in Iowa uh, as, as workplace injuries. Uh, we want to minimize that, but at the end of the day, it does come down to finances. And so, companies that are going to invest in this technology want to see some return beyond, you know, um, you know, the, the the count of the statistics of it. Yeah. Um, and so, part of that is the insurance workers' compensation. And so, um, how how were you thinking about that part of it, and how much did that play into the development of what you did, and the amount of data you collected, and and how you thought about the business model? Yeah, the embarrassing thing is, as I sit here on the Insurance Nerds podcast, right, I wasn't thinking about insurance when I started oh, it. Oh, and, horror! And and on top of it's, that, it's, it's uh, probably <laughs> it's probably better that way, right? Like it's. It really yeah. the focus should be on worker safety and and all of that, 
the yeah. insurance part of it should be should completely be secondary. And it really was. And you know, in the beginning, I was focused on how, how do I make life for guys like my dad better, right? He spends 90% of his time not managing safety, but managing safety process and safety paperwork, right? Um, all the reporting, the regulation, the compliance, the, those kinds of things, processing the paperwork, inputting things into spreadsheets, right? I'm like, man, I want to get him. I want 90% of his job to be focused on his people and having active, meaningful, productive, prescriptive conversations, right? So I needed to provide him the tools and resources and insights to be able to do that. So that was my focus. However, four years ago, after, you know, after the sale of my software company, about, I guess, three and a half years ago, uh, the Global Insurance Accelerator, which is here in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, reached out to me and said, Hey, you know, you've had some success in startups. Now you've had a few successful startups, you know, congratulations on the, the recent exit. Would you come down and serve as a mentor for us? Not because of any vast experience and knowledge in the insurance industry, but because of your startup experience, we'd love to have somebody in here to coach our startups about that. I said, sure. So I'd already spent a year down there at the GIA working with all of these companies making insure tech products and I was a year into, you know, it was, so the first year I didn't even have the idea for Make You Safe. Then here I am about eight months or so into this project. And it wasn't until the local newspaper uh, put, put us on the front page of the Sunday paper uh, with the title, you know, left to his own device, this man wants to save lives. And I started getting calls from all of my peers down at the GIA, like, Gabe, what the hell, man? You didn't tell us you were working on yeah. a project to revolutionize worker compensation. And I'm like, well, I didn't realize I was. So that was kind of the second genesis of Make You Safe was realizing there's a significant opportunity there yeah. with an insurance. So yeah, I wasn't, no, I, I wasn't I thinking mean, about that at first. At, at the end of the day, you have to be able to compute a return. If you're going to spend that money, and, and like I said, there's the statistics of um, how, many, how many fewer incidences there were, how many fewer deaths, how many fewer injuries, then to be able to tack on a financial part of that. We're saving X amount of dollars because we're having fewer injuries, we're saving on uh, you know, workers' compensation premiums, so on and so forth. It, it, at the end of the day, it becomes a win-win. It, it's just that one extra variable that you can tack on that makes your product that much more appealing to, you know, to the audience you're trying to sell it to. Well, and really what we discovered, so, you know, enter insurance companies and we said, all right, we're going to dive. We're going to go all in on this. We're going to figure out, like, how, do, how does our product actually really mesh with their world? Sure, they're going to love it, right? If we, can, if we can send more people home from work, if we can reduce accidents, there's absolutely opportunity there from the insurance side. Uh, but I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. And so we started collaborating with carriers, and we discovered two major problems that we could solve for them. You know, one is on the loss control side, right? So there's really, really two things. There's their loss ratio and there's ex expense ratio, right? And that's how they make up their profitability. And, and we found ways we can tackle things on both sides. So the first thing was their uh, on loss control. That's these carriers have a ton of resources. They have ergonomists, they have industrial hygienists, they've got tools, they've got trainings, they've got equipment, they've got safety trainers. They have all of this stuff that they can provide to the companies they insure to help reduce the risk of accidents in the facility. The problem is, is they deploy them in two ways. One, they have a website that has all of this content and they just expect that guys like my dad have all of this free time to go, huh, I'm bored today. I'm going to go over to my insurance company's website and just start watching training videos, right? And that, and that kind of stuff. So it's just really passive um, tool, right? Um, the other way they deploy them is they go, this company's had five incidents in the last six months. We're sending an ergonomist out. We're sending an IH out. We're going to go out with some tools. We're going to start testing the facility, right? The problem is, is they've already had five claims. You've already had five situations where losses have occurred. Now you're starting to try to decide, do I even want to insure this company? The, the time when you come out is there's a lot of friction, right? It's not a good relationship at that point. It's not positive. They're not there to give them a thumbs up, right? They're there to figure out what, what's going on. So that was problem number one is we showed them like with our data, we identify when the risk is starting to present itself. 
and our platform can act as a delivery tool for your resources. So I mentioned the high impact trends, right? So we identify that um, maybe there's an air quality issue in one part of their facility. TVOCs are starting to, to creep up, right? What's TVOC? Uh, total volatile organic compounds, right? So stinky, <laughs> stinky stuff in the air, right? There, there's something, it doesn't tell us exactly what it is. It just tells us eh, there's something going on um, in this area and it's out of the norm, right? We're using machine learning to understand, um, you know, when, when are things starting to trend in a direction that's, that's unfavorable or different, right? So it's now flagged as a high impact trend. This has a, a high potential. We can drill in on that. We can see who's involved, where it's happening in the facility, why it was flagged as a high impact trend. You know, a lot of information around that trend. But then we also said, let's offer them a series of remediation actions that they can take, guys like my father can take, to help remediate that risk. It's not enough just to tell them you've got a problem. Here's how you solve it, right? And some of those actions can be, you know, click here. And your insurance carrier is going to send an industrial hygienist out. They're going to bring a piece of equipment with them. They're going to do a three-day test, and they're going to find out what's going on in the air that's actually the problem, right? Um, it's something that our device can't actually do. You need that long exposure in a set area to determine what that is. The insurance company has the tools. They have the resources. They have the training to do that test. But as an insured, you probably don't know that that resource is available unless you've had a problem and you've had lots of claims. So why not click here, have that tool delivered to your facility, figure out what's going on, and have your insurance company be a partner in helping you resolve that. So that was problem number one. Problem number two on the insurance side of things was they don't build quality relationships with their customers on the work comp side. They talk to their customers at underwriting and they talk to their customers at claims. We wanted to make them an active part of building a safety culture in the, in the companies that they insure. They have the tools to do it. They have the training. They have the knowledge, the resources. And quite frankly, the companies that, that they insure have the desire to, especially those companies that are smaller, the, the 250 or less person companies where they don't have a dedicated safety person. They have an HR manager who also happens to be in charge of safety, who has to do all the compliance, who has to do all the reporting, who has to you know, take down all of the incidents, has, doesn't have the training, you know, doesn't have the resources. So why not arm her or him with the tools and resources that you have as an insurance carrier that are ultimately going to benefit you anyways? So we said we want to build that relationship and we want to make a platform that becomes a collaboration and communication tool to help bridge that gap between the carrier and the companies that they insure. And that's gonna improve expenses, right? Now, because your, your safety people in-house there, they don't have to go out and only touch two people or three people and travel to a facility and do an investigation to find out what kind of resources might we then bring back out to help you know, with them. They can look at a whole book of business. They can see what risk is being represented, who's actively taking steps. If anybody's presented a question to them, if anybody's looking for specific resources, they can see all of that stuff right there. And they can be more effective and efficient in the way that they use their time. So there's, there's ways we can impact it on both sides. How has the response been from the insurance ecosystem? Right. And uh, not just carriers, like, um, are, are you... Um, I, I would guess brokers would be interested in this as well. I mean, it's their customers at the end of the day. Um, how has the response been? No, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, for the last probably eight months, we've really been kind of embedded in this, um, in this world. And one, we get a ton of inbound um, requests now. In the early days, um, whenever I wanted to go talk to anybody, it was always like, you know, climbing up the food chain and trying to get a hold of the right people. Um, we were in property casualty 360 recently. Um, our phone and email inbox blew up. Work comp central um, podcasts like this. You know, the, the more that we've been out there in the world, the more that people are starting to contact us. And so, just uh, here a few weeks ago, plug and play out in California. Are you, are you familiar with plug and play? We were part. Of, we were one of the cohorts last year. Okay. Yep. yep. So very. Yep. So we just got invited to come pitch um, for their, their cohort competition right here a few weeks ago, and we were selected by the carriers uh, for cohort five. Yeah. So we're now actively participating. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, and plug and play. So I think that is just an example of how the folks in the industry are saying, 
you know, this is something that we know we need. Now, I will say that I think the biggest challenge with something like what we're doing is a lot of the carriers don't have the resources and infrastructure in place to do much with our product right now, right? They don't, they don't know how to get it in the hands of their customers. Um, they don't know how to use the data that we can provide them, right? So even if a carrier wants to interact with us, and sign an NDA and get access to a, a pile of data that we have from pilots that we've done at facilities where they've said, yes, you can scrape our information off of the data, but give it to people so they can do things with it, right? Um, a lot of carriers don't have data science teams or actuarial teams that can consume that data and do anything with it, right? Um, so right now, it's a lot of conjecture on both sides of just how much impact is this going to have and what kind of return is it going to have for the carrier? Yeah, no, I, I would. So I've been on a data and analytics team and I, that's a, that's a huge, pro, uh, that's a very um, understated problem in the, in the insurance ecosystem is, you know, we're now being swamped and bombarded with um, IOT data, but just even, I would say even just web data, you know, mm -hmm. being able open source data that you can pull out and the industry for a hundred plus years has been very actuarial driven. So they've priced moving forward by looking in the rear view mirror. Yeah. And you had mentioned, um, you had mentioned at one point where you, you don't learn anything in the past. They haven't learned anything unless there's actually been an incident. Mm -hmm. So they actually needed events to occur. And then it's like a plane crashes and then they have to figure out, well, what happened and let's make it better But that. And that works, but it's very slow. And you're turning on the fire hose of data and they don't have the infrastructure to be able to manage that. So I would also, I would also think from a regulatory standpoint on the insurance side that the regulators wouldn't understand it either. So um, pricing credits, you know, mm -hmm. like just, just, you know, your data is going to improve situation, but no one really knows how much or they don't trust it or, you know, it hasn't been vetted or gone through the right channels, so it hasn't been blessed yet. Um, have you have you had any interactions with regulators? Because I would think their their goal of workplace safety is so high that I think they would eagerly um, make changes to the pricing of workers' comp for for companies that implemented this kind of technology. Yeah, I, I think you know, a couple of things around that, right? You're right. They're doing quantitative analysis on past incidents to try to determine what the risk is going forward, right? Which is a little counterintuitive, but I understand why you do that. And then you look at like, all right, now we have all of this forecasting data, this predictive data, um, but we don't have any methods for, for, you know, how we do quantitative uh, modeling behind what value this is. And part of the challenge is, is just because you're gathering environmental data doesn't necessarily show the, the change in risk that happens when you change the safety ecosystem of a facility, right? So here's an example, this, this maybe will clarify that <laughs> in a little bit better way. So we tested in a facility here in Des Moines, Iowa in August. Um, we spent the month of August out there testing. Now we tested on a fraction of their workforce, right? We don't have a ton of prototype product right now. We're going through that process, but uh, we tested in this facility for the first time in five years, the month of August, they didn't have a recordable incident, right? Now, was Make You Safe solely responsible for that? You know, it, we were on a fraction of their workforce, right? But I could tell you this, we were out there two or three times a week. We were working with their safety director, their chief operations officer. Um, we were talking to the employees. We were interviewing employees. We were talking about the device, the product. We were showing them reports. We were doing a lot of things to get information from them. That's why we do these pilots, right? Is they provide just as much information to us as, as we do to them, if not more. And the result was no accidents, right? And so just because you track temperature and humidity doesn't mean that you're gonna reduce the risk of accidents because of temperature, temperature and humidity. It's what you do with that information and how you actively work that into a safety culture. And that's the power of our tool and our platform is having grown up around the industry, spent so much time in the industry and understanding what these people face, we knew we had to provide a tool that is simple, that's easy, 
that provides valuable insights and removes work from these people so they can then take action and do things with this stuff instead of giving them all of the data and them not being a data scientist or giving them all of these visuals of data but not providing any direction on what the story is that it's telling uh, we wouldn't be doing anything for these people we'd just be providing probably more work for them more frustration and ultimately they'd probably use the product for three weeks and they'd be like yeah we're not i'm not gonna mess with this thing anymore right so that that i think is the magic behind it so even when we're talking to regulators or we're talking to uh, insurance carriers or we're talking to people that run these facilities it's not the data itself that's going to reduce the accidents. It's what's done with that data that does. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that reminds me of the podcast I had with uh, David Tobias of uh, Betterview uh, Drone Company. And uh, he, he, was, he was in the insurance biz. He thought there was an application of drones to commercial adjusting and inspection. And then they provided these adjusters with all of these awesome photos and the, I mean, not the adjusters, the underwriters. And they're just like, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, it's like, and it's, it's something that they wanted, but then they got it and it's like, okay, we need more direction on this. And all of a sudden the light bulb went off on their head, in their head and said, ah, that, that's not the product. The product is the insight and the direction that comes from that. So that's, that's uh, awesome advice for, anyone that's listening to this that has that entrepreneurial bug, you're not, you're not always sure what the product is. You think you know what the product is, yeah. but the, the product could be something very different, you know, depending on what, the, what the, uh, your customer wants. Uh, do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I've got uh, an older and a younger brother and then an older sister. So in Thanksgiving, do you and your dad just kind of go off in the corner <laughs> and just kind of talk shop and just let the rest of the family have, you know, have a peaceful dinner? You know what's funny is before I started my startup career, uh, I worked in loss prevention for uh, Target Corporation. And both of my brothers work now in loss prevention for Target Corporation. So I mean, I caught shoplifters at a store in college wearing jeans and a t-shirt, carrying a pair of handcuffs. Uh, my older brother now runs an investigation division in Chicago. You know, they have surveillance vans and they do all kinds of crazy stuff. So, you know, we talk, we talk safety, we talk losses, we talk yeah. all kinds of things. And in a way, it, you know, it all kind of plays together. Of course. Of course. I would love it. But, <laughs> but for family members that aren't into it, they must be like, oh, here we go again. So let's talk sports. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I would like to transition over to more personal side of the podcast, get to know yeah. you a little bit better and uh, for our audience as well. Um, so just uh, some, some layup questions, hopefully for you. Uh, Gabriel, when you aren't working, what do you enjoy doing? Uh, I spend a lot of time camping with my family. So we've got two little boys, uh, one that just turned four on Sunday um, and my six year old will be seven in November. And uh, we have a lake that's about 10 minutes from our house and uh, we've got a camper. So Fridays we hook up the camper, we head out to the lake. Uh, sometimes I even leave the camper out there for the week and I'll find time to go into the office for a little while. And then when I want to unplug and be alone, take my laptop, go out to the campground. There's Wi-Fi and hotspots everywhere now. And I can sit by the lake and, you know, just get in my zone and go. So we probably spend a lot of time doing that. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love that. Uh, if you were stuck on an island, what's one album that you would take <laughs> with you? Uh, oh, man. So that's assuming I have something to play music yes. on, right? But you can only uh, take one album with you. Um, you know, I'm really into Chris Tomlin right now. Um, most of my most of my music is I run audio at my church. Um, I run audio production now. After I bought all that equipment from them, they they talked me into running production. So I've got a ninety six channel Digico nice. uh, mix board uh, that I've spent a couple years learning. So I, you know, I'll run production there. So yeah, I'm into Christian music, and right now Chris Tomlin's probably at the top of my list. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, you you are a little bit techy, so. Um, I'm interested to hear what, if you have any tools or techniques that you use to stay productive and or organized and anything like stick out like, wow, what a, what an awesome tool or technique this is. And this really helps my life. Hmm. You know, what's funny is I, I'm probably a little bit more, uh, old school 
in the way that I manage things. Um, you know, my inbox is basically my inbox, and my calendar, are basically my whole life. Right. I, I probably like a lot of people, like I'll read something and I'll be like, Oh, that needs action. Mark is unread and leave it, leave it in the inbox. Um, I add notes and everything to my calendar uh, all the time. Um, but aside from that, I, I probably live on my iPhone, but I don't think there's anything really special or unique that, um, that I use At one point I was really big into if this, then that, uh, if you remember that yes. application, it's still, it's still pretty popular, but I used to, um, have a lot of gadgets and things like that that we always use if this and that to, to do different things. But fair enough. You're, you're not alone. A, a lot of guests are, are um, have either gone techie and then back to old school or just stayed old school. Um, and, and I've been, I've been carrying a manual calendar with me. I just feel yeah. like writing it, writing it down kind of drills it into my head and I like looking at it and touching it. So, um, and, and I gave up Kindle books. I just, I want to touch the book. Sure. You know, so. I haven't given up my Audible yet. That's one thing I haven't gone away from. I, I, I just uh, I have too much uh, drive time and things like that to yeah. to not fill with audiobooks. So yeah, absolutely. Um, have there been any books that you found to be influential in your business and or personal lives? Mm. Yeah, um, I would say top top books for me. I think from a business side, there's a couple, and then a personal side. So business side. Uh, shoe dog, uh, hands down one of my favorite. Have you, are you familiar with shoe dog? No. So that's, it's that's the, why I asked these questions. Uh, yeah. So it's the, the memoirs of Phil Knight and Nike. And it talks about, you know, I didn't realize this, but really Nike, uh, although they just celebrated right their, their 30th anniversary and say what you want about them, you know, politically and that kind of stuff the, the story is fascinating, really how they got started. They actually really kind of got their start back in the sixties. Um, it's Tiger Shoe Company and just the story of, of Phil Knight and how that company was built. I mean, and it's so well written. I, I laughed, you know, I cried. There was just, there was so much emotion in the book. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think, um, I think it's Bill Gates who said it's in his top five books of all time. And that's, that's how I latched onto it. So uh, that, and then I just finished, um, I think it was like 25 or 27 hours of audio it was uh, Steve Jobs, uh, Walter Isaacson, yeah. uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, fa fascinating look at um, the start of of Apple and um, Steve Jobs as a human being and as an individual, uh, just a very very interesting person, interesting character. And there was a lot of things that I just really wasn't aware of about his. Um, you know, he's responsible for Pixar and you know all yeah. the movies that came out of that. I, I I read that book on vacation one time. It was one of my favorite vacations because I just <laughs> jumped in that book. And it just, <laughs> Must have been a long vacation because that it was. Like, it took a whole it took a whole <laughs> week to read that book, but that's pretty much all I did. It was so enjoyable, and you're right. Like the dichotomy. Um, brilliant man, um, highly flawed. Yeah. Like, and that's what I'm, uh, that's what like we, we plant these people up on pedestals. Mm -hmm. uh, Warren Buffett's another one where we put these people up on pedestals and they're, they're, they are a genius, but these are highly flawed people just like the rest of us. We all are. Mm -hmm. And no one is innocent, you know, when it comes to, you know, being flawed like that. And that's what I took away. It was like, man, this guy is such a prick. Like I couldn't, <laughs> I, I couldn't do what he does you know, in yeah. lots of different ways, but I wouldn't want to, like, I, I really wouldn't want to tr change places with him because I don't want that, the flawed part of him, you know? Yeah. And so th that's, that's what I took away. It was an amazing book. Yeah. Like, you wonder, it's like, like this thick. If, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And you wonder, right. If he didn't have the success that he had, would he just be known as another a-hole that yeah. was in business and Completely. you know failed because he was right. But <laughs> because of the success, you know, the thing that he did was surround himself with brilliant people um, that could tolerate him. Um, so the, I, I think on the business side, those are really the two books that I, I enjoy. There's, you know, a lot of self-help books out there. I'm going through Grit right now by Angela Duckworth. That's an interesting book. Um, and then on the personal side, uh, I think two that were my favorite, Bonhoeffer. Um, Bonhoeffer is, uh, it's a true story. It's about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a priest in Germany, um, that led the resistance movement against Hitler and was part of an assassin, a failed assassination attempt, um, uh, against Hitler. And it's, uh, it, it's just an unbelievable, that, that there again, that's another 
that's a that's a thick one to go through but it changed my perspective on nazi germany on on the the war on what happened on christianity it, there was so many things about that book that were incredible um and just hearing his story uh super emotional there again um, and then one that was, is a little more whimsical, I guess, in that it's a historical fiction, right? And not necessarily a, a factual book, although it's based heavily on fact, is uh, The Last Days of Night. And uh, The Last Days of Night is uh, the story of the patent war between George Westinghouse and Thomas Edison over the light bulb and electricity. Mm-hmm. And it's written from um, the fictional perspective of the actual attorney that they hired um, on George Westinghouse's side to to fight that and uh, real characters um, uh, certainly a real uh, incident right and there, there's a lot of reality to it the, the reason it's more historical fiction is uh, they obviously don't have the people to talk to anymore and understand how the dialogue and conversations happen there's uh, really good dialogue that happens in there and you can imagine this is probably very close to what would have actually been said. Um, so it gives you this really cool picture of, of the beginning of uh, GE Corporation and, and that battle between George and, and Thomas. It's pretty yeah. cool. It, ironic that it seems like GE is going to, GE suffering and may not exist. Um, they, they're, they've they reached that existential moment, which if, if it goes to show you, I don't care if you're Amazon or Apple or Walmart, you're you're a sliver away from failure you're a sliver away from dying. Um, yep. And uh, it, a lot, lot of lessons there. So I have one final question before I catch yeah. you loose. Sure. Um, highly personal. Okay. You're in Des Moines, Iowa. What's your favorite zombie burger? <laughs> oh, man. Um, oh, what's it called? Uh, is it like the trailer? Trash burger or something like that. It's got jalapeno poppers, uh, bacon, uh, barbecue sauce. I don't know. Awesome. Yeah, it's just awesome. yeah, it's a heart attack yeah. on a plate. So uh, I've been to the GIA a couple times, and and we have um, not only the GIA but the Global Insurance Symposium yeah. as well. I'll be I'll probably be going to that as well, and uh, and that's I, I walked around interviewing people there for this podcast and, and uh, you know, everyone has a zombie burger story. It's like, uh, you yeah. know, if you go to Des Moines, Iowa, you, you have to go to zombie burgers. So you got to check it out. Are you going to be at uh, InsureTech connect? Well, not, but I can, I can connect you with some folks uh, that I'm, I'm associated with. Yeah. There's juggling way too much, too many conferences. I'm going to three other conferences in October. Everybody's- Everybody's doing everything in October. I go from there down to Austin for enterprise wearables. Um, it's just, I mean, it's stacked. You got InsureTech Week in Des Moines um, at the GIA. Insurance Nerds Day, October 6th. Um, I hope, I'm not sure this will be live by then, but um, yeah, that that's primarily the reason why I'm not going. It's like, that's two conferences in one week. Sure. I got a seven-week-old at home. My wife would well, me. Man, are you sleeping? No. <laughs> well, yeah, partially, but she, my wife's a good sport. Uh, not as much as I need, so that's for sure. That's why I look the way I do. So, <laughs> no, you look uh, great, man. Anyways, uh, this this kind of blew my mind. Um, Thank you. This is this is pretty awesome stuff. Uh, um, this is this is like the real insure tech. This isn't like we're gonna make a pretty website. This is yeah. you know solving a gigantic problem using technology. Um, this is where I was. I'm hoping IntroTech evolves to, and you're already there. So hats off, um, you know, be- best of luck going forward. And you're um, you're always welcome to come on this podcast or whatever. Like, I, I would like to follow this because this is a big deal. Cool. Be happy to be on anytime. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you to the listeners for checking this out. And uh, anybody's welcome to reach out to us at, at Make You Safe. We'd be happy to talk to them. Yep. So my guest this week has been Gabriel Glenn of Makusafe. Makusafi. <laughs> Makusafi. <laughs> Is it Makusafi? No, it's Makusafe. Uh, make you safe, but yeah. yeah make you safe. Is that what the Hawaiian is Maku? Yes. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Gabriel Glenn, co-founder and CEO of Make You Safe. Thank you so much.